Yeah, well, ThinkTech makes my day. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech Hawaii. More specifically, this is transitional justice. And we are talking about truth commissions with Cecilia Kusterman, and she is um, a member of Project Expedite Justice out of Kona, Hawaii. Uh, great to see you, Cecilia. Great to see you too. Well, let's talk about truth commissions. You know, I mean, we got we had sort of an, an entry to the subject in examining various countries in Africa. I guess mostly East Africa, Central Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, where horrible atrocities and war crimes and, um, and things along those lines had taken place. And um, I think they need one right now in South Africa as well, by the way. It's like, you know, exploding all over Africa um, to find out what really happened. Um, and there have been truth commissions in Africa. There was a truth commission in Southeast Asia, you know, for a while. Uh, I think this is actually still going on years later. And um, you have various um, um, atrocities, war crimes and the like that have been revealed most recently, including in your own Canada and in the United States. And um, we need to get to the bottom of it. Now, one thing that struck me about your write-up of the subject though, Cecilia, is you said that there were arguments on both sides of the question um, to have truth commissions. So I can understand uh, why it's important to have truth commissions, but you pointed out there are some negatives to having truth commissions. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think as with most transitional justice mechanisms, you shouldn't pursue just one or the other. The thing with truth commissions is they really focus on, as they say, the truth, fact finding, giving victims a chance to speak out. It's much broader also in like evidence co collection and um, kind of what you can talk about. But um, I think a lot of the critique or a lot of critique that I think um, is warranted is that often they're done very rushed. And so victims will only have like two minutes to speak. And that can also be um, very triggering for victims, bringing up a lot of trauma. So that's one of the kind of downsides. And when they're not done in like conjunction with something else, like let's say prosecutions, then it's really just um, victims speaking about their experience and it's not holding any perpetrators to account. Um, which I think is difficult on the victims. And then also, obviously you have this like side of um, kind of recording in history what has gone on and all of that. And in a way saying, okay, we'll do better. But um, there is something to be said for kind of actually going along the lines of a criminal prosecution again as well, especially for the perpetrators. Yeah, I totally agree. But you know, isn't the you know isn't the magic in in the detail? I mean, for example, if I just have a um, a chain of witnesses come up and testify about their bad, horrible experiences and all that, um, it's like unformed. It's like unstructured in a way. And what you really need is a, you mentioned prosecutor, but you know you can have a an investigation pretty much along the same lines where there's a um, investigator who calls them up and he specifies which ones he wants to talk to um, and he asks them questions and he forms up you know the facts that are brought out. Now you can say that's more structured than people just walking in but on the other hand if you're after the truth then you really need some kind of rules. Um, so if I if I told you that a commission was organized where there would be an investigator in the nature of a prosecutor. And he would decide who the witnesses and the documents were, and he would decide what questions to ask. Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that deal with some, at least some of your concerns? For sure, but I think a lot of the truth commissions, especially the more recent ones, they do have a lot of structure to them and they're um, conducted in a way that is very kind of straightforward and there's a procedure and um, it's very like rigorous. I just think what is also important is the whole point of truth commissions is, right, 
like come forward, speak the truth, not just victims, but also perpetrators, like that they feel like they're not going to get prosecuted for whatever um, tr they're offering. Because a lot of the times when you have mass atrocities, there's just so many question marks, so many open ends. People are looking for their family. People are looking for their loved ones. Um, and while I think that's really important, especially to answer all of those open-ended questions, um, I think there should still be just separate from a truth commission, really, uh, investigation or some kind of prosecution followed that holds um, perpetrators of mass atrocities to account. Well, okay, but let me let me add this thought and see what you say. Uh, it's a lot harder to prosecute somebody, um, bring in evidence, sufficient evidence, whatever the standard may be, um, convict them and send them to jail, um, and then publicize it in such a way so that it has an effect on you know the rep the possible repetition of what happened. Uh, it's harder to prosecute, isn't it? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, first of all, evidence collection is just in prosecutions so much harder um, because the amount of evidence you can even get in is so much narrower um, compared to the kind of evidence that is brought before truth commissions. So for sure, it's much more difficult. But I think there's just still in, in the international community, there's much more weight given to a prosecution than to a truth commission. So it's truth commissions are often seen kind of as a more soft approach. And let's say you have whatever, something like what happened in South Africa or anywhere, and you're only doing a truth commission, then perpetrators would be like, okay, well, if that's my only per repercussion, then I'm just going to keep going. What's to stop them if they're never held to account, whether they're jailed or not is a way different question that we who knows how much time we need for that, but um, it's more just the fact that they will be investigated by some kind of more legit, not more legitimate, some kind of stricter body that could hold them to account in the sense of jailing because truth yeah. commission can't do that. So Project Expedite Justice has followed truth commissions. And as I, I'm sure at some level, it's encouraged them because we all want to know what happened. And we want to, you know, bring that out of the sunlight. Um, on the other hand, let me ask you this. Over the past few years, uh, to the extent you've followed it, would you say that there are more truth commissions, that they're more probative, or that there are fewer of them and possibly less probative? And the people who would be the targets on these truth commissions, the one who's, who have, um, you know, conducted the atrocities, if you will, have watched and learned how to beat it. They've learned how to avoid accountability in the course of these truth commissions. And so the truth commissions, um, you know, uh, don't have the same kind of um, um, authority, if you will, or power that they used to have. Is there a trend? I, what I'm really asking is what's the dynamic in Africa and uh, elsewhere on how these, you know, um, commissions are doing? I wouldn't really say that there's a trend that, let's say, X number of years ago, they were doing better than they are doing now. Um, I do think that, I don't know, that it, it might have to do with like my environment and my background and where I come from. Um, but I do I think- I want you to take a moment and tell us what that is. Oh, well, so I'm from, um, I'm from Vancouver. Well, I'm from Germany and Canada. I was born in Germany. Um, and I lived in Canada in Vancouver for 10 years. And um, I did my undergraduate law degree at SOAS in London. Um, so that's kind of where my interest in Truth Commission started because SOAS takes a very, um, in my opinion, amazing approach to the way that they teach us. And so we focused on different legal systems in Asia and Africa during our um, law degree, which is not really that common if you go to like a standard law degree in Australia or Canada. Um, and there I first heard about um, kind of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that were conducted in South Africa and also in Rwanda. And Rwanda really interested me because they did the um, what's called the Gachacha Courts, which was effectively just like it was led by um, 
different leaders of different tribes. And it was really just about like getting the community to come together and to talk about everything. And for them, that worked really well. Um, and I think the important thing or the thing that distinguishes truth commissions is kind of how you take them and adapt them to your community and to your circumstances. Because if you're just going to take an approach that worked for one country and for one mass atrocity, that doesn't necessarily mean you can apply that to another country with a different um, mass atrocity. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's interesting because as I was coming up with this topic and being like, okay, what can I talk about and feel comfortable about? I, for example, I am Canadian and I didn't know that we had a truth and reconciliation commission for um, kind of everything that's happened and happened with the indigenous people in Canada. I didn't know that. Um, which to me, I don't know, maybe it's just because what's happened in Canada isn't that at the forefront of, of the international world or like it just hasn't fit into my studies, but it's also weird that I never, or strange that I never heard about it as a Canadian, I think. Hmm. But that, okay, so in view of that, um, in view of that background, if you will, and thank you for that, um, what's the dynamic? Um, is the world uh, more interested or the same or less interested in creating and uh, abiding by the facts that are found in, in truth commissions? I don't know if it's really something that gets abided by. I think it's, um, it's as, as I've said, mainly about the victims and giving them a chance to speak. Um, and giving them a chance to tell their side of what the events that happened. And discouraging um, conduct of the same kind in the future somehow, no? Yes, exactly. But um, truth commissions often just end in, in reports. So that's what um, happened in Canada. They concluded their truth commission in 2015, and there was a report published. Um, and often, and this is kind of one of the difficulties, often if you have evidence pre presented in a truth commission, that evidence can't actually be used in other proceedings. So it's about finding that balance, right? So if you have a truth commission and also a prosecution, what evidence do you use for which? And where do you put that witness because you don't want to compromise it? Um, yeah, it's a difficult area. You say that if you adduce evidence in a truth commission, you can or cannot use it in a criminal proceeding? It depends. There's no like rule of thumb. Um, I just know that there are concerns about that because you have to, for a criminal proceeding, you have to collect evidence in a very specific way. Um, you need to know where it started. You have to have some kind of right chain of evidence collection and all of that so that you know it's 100% or as close to legitimate as mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. get versus in a truth commission, it's about victims telling their truth and their experience. And that's subjective in and of itself. And nobody's out there probing whether or not that really happened because that's the point. You're supposed to have a platform to speak about what happened to you without anybody scrutinizing you or criticizing you or saying, I don't think that's true. Doesn't, um, doesn't this all reflect or bear on or bring into the conversation the efficacy of the press? And of course, that will differ from country to country, from you know the location of one atrocity or another, and it's just how good the press is to start with. But then, you know, one has to ask, uh, why didn't the press cover this in the first place? That same question has been raised about our uh, January 6th uh, insurrection. Um, you know, we don't have a commission, not an operating commission. It's been seven, let me think, eight months almost. In August, it'll be eight months, uh, which, which is a pretty generous, um, possibly the worst thing that's ever happened to the American government, barring no other event. Um, um, and, and so, um, has the press done the job? Could the press have done the job? Uh, the press tried, surely did. But, you know, there were things I, th I think that stood in the way. You know, for example, um, there were people who discouraged the press. 
Uh, there were people who criticized the press, who called them the enemy of the people. There were people who set up false news that had the effect of undermining the press, and that's still happening. Mm -hmm. So one would expect where it's a clear atrocity um, or crime uh, that the press would get right in there, roll up its sleeves right away, and tell us all what's happening. Now, part of that is the fault of the press, I suppose. But the other part is that maybe people don't have an expectation that the press will tell them everything. Maybe they don't trust the press. Um, maybe, maybe, are you ready for this, Cecilia? Maybe they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about atrocities and war crimes. And so they're, they're not demanding that the press roll up its sleeves and get in there and tell them. But what I suggest to you, and I would like your, your comment on, is um, shouldn't the press be doing more to reveal the atrocity before um, we have to go through the mm, delay and, if you will, the bureaucracy of a full tilt proof commission that takes years to conduct? I think that's an, a very interesting point, but I think they do two completely different things. As you say, the press is supposed to be on the ground reporting while the events are unfolding and whatever is going on versus truth commissions. They're often set up by um, newly formed governments or governments that are transitioning because they wanna show, okay, we're gonna make a change or we're gonna move forward from this. Um, truth commissions often come about after some event has already happened versus the press is supposed to be there, at least in my opinion, while it's happening. That doesn't mean there's no place for the press afterwards, but I, I personally rely on the press to be reporting to me as something is occurring, um, because that's the way that I find out what's going on in other countries. Um, and I don't think it's that, I mean, um, if we're talking about the international sphere, sure, maybe some people just don't care. That is, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I think the press faces a lot of its own challenges. I mean, either things are reported, but then they're censored or they're blocked by a government from reporting something. Or, I mean, like it, you could go on and on with all the difficulties that the press faces, but I think that the press and um, truth commissions to do two very different things. Mm. Now, it has to be a kind of a perfect storm for a commission to be created and to um, you know be effective. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of these commissions, maybe all of them, are generated out of um, out of uh, a transition of some kind. Um, what's the name of our show? Uh, a transitional justice. It's all about transition. So if I give you the same environment, the same set of circumstances. The same government leaders that existed while the atrocity was going on, they're not going to be too interested in having a truth commission about their own conduct. It takes a transition. It takes somebody to say, wait, 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 we can't, we can't make a, a, a proper transition here without finding out what happened before. It, it legitimizes our transition. It enforces, encourages, you know, gives us uh, it gives us the space for a transition. And therefore, on the flip side of that is if there is no transition, or if the transition is imperfect or involves the same actors, then A, they're not going to want a commission, and B, they're not going to want the press to cover it either. Exactly. I think you speak a lot of truth there. And I think I there are instances, I can't name them off of the top of my head, but I, I do believe, for example, Canada. They didn't have a transition in government, but um, they did set up a truth commission. But this is where my critique is coming from. And maybe I, I feel like I can say this because I am Canadian, um, but they concluded their truth commission in 2015 and now we're in 2000, uh, we're in 2021 and there are um, unmarked graves and mass graves being uncovered related exactly to what those truth commissions were set up to kind of reconcile and help people move past. And that's kind of the, I think the issue with, the issue that truth commissions face is how do you conclude something if all of the evidence isn't there yet, if things are still being covered up. And the reason I 
think Canada is such a good example for what you're saying is because they never transitioned in government. And I think there is a tendency to want to say, all right, it happened. Okay, we made this truth commission. We've given repar reparations to the Indigenous people. Um, now let's move on. Let's forget about it. And then, but when these like mass graves are uncovered or unmarked graves, all of a sudden you're in this predicament because you're, as a government, how are you going to say, wow, this never happened and brush it under the rug if you have 700 unmarked graves? It's a bit difficult, in my opinion. Well, the Truth Commission is always going to hold these events up against or through the lens of the, what do you want to call it, the ethical environment at the time the commission is, is sitting. So, for example, um, I'm not sure it would have been effective in the United States to have a, maybe there was something along these lines, but I never heard about it, a Truth Commission after the Civil War. What really happened there? Um, we have a lot of art and entertainment. We have documentaries and the like e examining that today. But he whiz, that's 150 years ago, and um, none, none of the people are alive. And uh, we, you know, we're not going to get to the bottom of it very well about exactly what happened on those slavery print plantations. Uh, we have some literature, but it's not nearly a truth commission. And so I think um, if you don't do it, this is my proposition. If you don't do it pretty quickly after the event, you never really learn what happened. Uh, and if you find, for example, that there were atrocities in Oklahoma um, in the 20s, the 1920s, um, Tulsa, as a matter of fact, um, and you don't really examine them uh, for 100 years, it's very hard to get your hand on what happened. If there had been a truth commission right after the Oklahoma event, which was atrocious. Um, it would have been different than a truth commission today because the times were different and the, the racism perhaps was greater or more tolerated then than it would be today. It's that whole thing about the, you know, the timing is everything. And so I'm, I'm lost about whether the Truth Commission right here at the event is as effective as the Truth Commission 100 years later, or even 50. And um, whether a Truth Commission 50 years later can really understand the nature of, of the community, the environment around the event after 50 years have gone by. So what do you, what do you think about timing? How important is it that we do this right after? Um, and is it is there a benefit in waiting? I think um, it's timing is definitely very important. I think it's very important um, to do them relatively to set up a truth commission relatively um, close to the time of a mass atrocity or whatever event we're trying to investigate, because as you say, um, like times change. And if we do something 100 years later, it's going to be a completely different circumstance than when it actually happened. And also because truth commissions are very victim centered, um, you want to give those victims a chance to speak. And 50 years, 100 years later, those victims might not still be around. Um, or they also might have just wanted to move on with their lives or have repressed trauma. I mean, there's lots of different factors that come in there. Um, and yeah, I think timing is definitely important. I think if you're conducting a truth commission 50 to 100 years later, it's there's a completely different point to it at that point. I think it's not so much about um, about reparation and closure for victims. It's not so much about um, a, a new government or a body or people saying, okay, this was bad and we're going to move past this. It's more about, um, as you say, not knowing what really went on. And it's much more of like an investigation or like a fact-finding mission of what went on at that time and what can we kind of collect and gather and get together now, 50 or 100 years later, um, whether that's the news clippings or kind of evidence collection or examination of witnesses and victims way after the fact. Um, but yeah, I think that those kind of truth commissions come about more because either it wasn't possible to create a truth commission after the fact, 
um, or it wasn't something that was even considered. And um, then later people are like, okay, well, I would love to know what, what went on here and if there's any anything more that we can find out. But I do think that, and most, most truth commissions get established pretty soon after, um, after the event, because that is that is the importance there. Well, there there you take me to uh, what what we needed, what we do need to discuss, um, and that's the commission on January sixth. Um, okay, it's 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 into August already, just about. That's mm -hmm. um, she was that's eight months, and we haven't had a commission, and there are people who resist the commission. There are powerful people and forces and political parties, although that I use that term loosely when I refer to the GOP, uh, who oppose a truth commission and who have taken you know, huge steps to avoid one, stop one, undermine one. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts about this? We're talking about a commission that would look into the most traumatic thing our democracy, our government has ever experienced. Uh, even worse than you know, the taking, the sacking of the Capitol in 1812. Um, by the British, they're the same guys who established Canada, by the way. <laughs> Put that on the table. <laughs> Those British. <laughs> oh, the British. So, you know, what are your thoughts? You must think about that. You must see the same press that I see. So what's, what's going on here? Why do we need a commission? Why do we need a commission and why are we not having one? And what would a commission do for us after that particularly egregious event? I think that's a very, I mean, not that uh, the things that truth commissions have tackled up until now weren't very, very difficult questions, but I think I think that's a very interesting because the January 6th commission, right, it passed in the House, but it was struck down by the Senate. Um, and I think it's a very big step that it was even introduced and it got that far. Um, because the thing about the US is they're so on opposite sides when it comes to these things, right? Some people say, like, let's look at this, this we need to overturn this, this can never happen again. And some people say, you know what, that was just civilians doing civilian things because they felt threatened and we're going to protect our um, our civilians or whatever, and then we leave it. I think it's very interesting. When I think back to January 6th and when I was sitting in, I was sitting in Germany at the time watching it all unfold, I thought I was in some alternate universe. Like I didn't think that was real life. I was like, no way. If I felt like I was in a movie. The Capitol is being stormed. Um, and then it kind of just went away, you know, like once Biden then became president, it just kind of faded. And I think, yeah, I think it's very interesting. I do think that there um, would be great benefits to having a commission, but then also it's like, what really are you going to investigate? There's people that like, we know what happened it was documented, it was put live on every streaming platform out there basically. Um, and I don't know if the people that were actually in the Capitol that were affected um, would want to speak out about it. I'm, I'm not sure that they all would. I definitely think some would. Um, and I definitely think it was traumatizing for a lot of people. Um, but it's just such a surreal, situation. I wouldn't even, I would love to have a truth commission, but I wouldn't even know how it would unfold. Yeah, no, that's true. It would unfold like a circus. And and mark my word, uh, that's, that's what could happen because the people who oppose it don't want to examine these things. And what are these things? It's not so much what we saw on television, you know, the, as you referred to earlier, the immediacy of the press coverage. It's what forces led to this. What does this mean? What does this mean in the country? Uh, the sociological um, or psychosociological forces, um, the economic forces, um, you know, it's, it's things have changed. We should know about them because they had real context. They had, they had real 
re reality, uh, as we all saw on January 6th. And we, you know, I guess there, you know, there are a lot of reasons to know about that. So um, you know where the country is going and who was involved, who created it. It's sort of like a, one of those truth commissions in Africa. You need to know who did it. Uh, because right now, you know, A, we don't know, really. And B, um, there are people who want to prevent us from knowing. Uh, all the more reason that we want to know. Um, so, you know, that, that's coming up. This is, you know, this is a very relevant, very timely discussion between you and me. But let me take you on a trip. I, I, I think we should go on a trip, Cecilia. Um, this, is going. this is a global trip we're going to take, you know, because right now, and maybe it's just me, um, but the world is burning. You know, we have we have riots and we have protests going on in so many places. We have claims of government mis, mis, misbehavior. Uh, authoritarian governments are, are moving to the right. Uh, you know, they seem to be everywhere these days. Um, and the same kind of uh, psychosociological events that took place that are taking place in the United States are arguably taking place elsewhere. Governments are changing, moving to the right. Authoritarians are emerging um, and, and doing things that are atrocities and war crimes, sorry, um, things that we need to know about. So the trip that you and I are going to take, Cecilia, is let's say we, we have the power to establish truth commissions, you and me. Where would we go? What parts of the world, um, you know, require our services? What parts of the world require truth commissions? What comes to mind? You know, we know there are places uh, in transitional justice in Africa, uh, you know, East Africa, Central Africa happening right now. Um, and, and that is probably the focus point for a lot of truth commissions. But gee whiz, you know, what about Ukraine? What about South America? What, you, what comes to mind for you? What comes to mind for me? Honestly, just from what we spoke about, I would set up so many truth commissions in the United States. And then I would hope for massive upheaval and just a reinvention of everything we know. That would be awesome, um, in my opinion. I think you can have truth commissions, honestly, like anywhere. The places that are in the most need would be, I mean, the US. And then I know that, for example, South Sudan is currently in the process of setting up a truth commission. Um, and I mean, if we're thinking South America, there's so many different countries, Cambodia, Venezuela, um, but it also, it has to come from within the country itself, right? It has to come from the, the government itself or um, some, large kind of consensus that this is what they need. Otherwise, it won't be effective. Um, it can never be some third party coming in and being like, I think you should have a truth commission now because then it won't be able to do its do its job. But yeah, I mean, Turkey, Ukraine, definitely. And it's always these places where something flares up, right, and comes to the forefront and is all over the media. And then just as quickly, the coverage dies down and everybody seems to almost forget about it. And I wonder all the time, I'm like, well, what's going on there? Because I'm sure their problems didn't just go away because they're not in um, mainstream media anymore. But yeah, this is like mm. playing, playing the all powerful, where will I set up my truth commissions? I, I, I'm reminded of uh, what I thought was a turning point, uh, namely in Rwanda, um, which was really a mess, which is probably still a mess, uh, where the United Nations had some observer type troops there um, to try to keep the lid on things. And it struck me that the United Nations had gotten to a place where it was completely ineffectual uh, in keeping a lid on things, just ineffectual. And um, if you think about it, from the time of the creation of the United Nations, what, 1945 or six, um, till then and now, till now, 
the United Nations is uh, really not effective in terms of dealing with truth commissions. And what you said is what people around the world say, um, you know, it's, it's delicate. If we have some kind of issue in Uganda, um, we don't want anybody, you know, coming in and telling us what to do. Um, and indeed, the United Nations doesn't have the willpower, uh, the support, the money, um, you know, or the, or the, or the, the respect, if you will, uh, of, of these countries that we could identify um, to come in and say, you will. No, you will. We really mean it. You will have a truth commission. But let me ask you my last question. Wouldn't it be better if the United Nations or a body like the United Nations had that power and said, look, we smell a, we smell a rat here. We smell an atrocity. We have enough media information to make us think that something really awful is going on and we are going to establish a truth commission. Get out of the way. Wouldn't that be better? I think it, that's such a difficult question because in some ways, yes, definitely. If the UN had some kind of enforcement behind it, some kind of enforcement body, just like if the ICC had some kind of um, enforcement body behind it, it, it would be much more effective. But then there's always this danger of institutions, organizations, countries, whatever is overstepping and not minding their own business and getting too involved. And I am a huge believer in just going from the ground up and really giving wherever it is, whether it's the government or the people themselves or whatever, the tools to do that themselves and to set up their own truth commissions or to go about their own prosecutions. And I know, like, I know that that doesn't always happen. And most of the time it doesn't happen. Um, but if we're always going to say some third party or some organization is going to come in and, and dictate that for you. I mean, you see it, you see it with the way that the UN unfolded or the ICC unfolded. There's so much pushback coming from all sides that at the end of the day, it's really just everyone saying no to each other and a lot of bureaucracy and not a, not everything getting done that everybody wanted to initial, initially get done. So I think it's, it's, it's very difficult. I think in a lot of instances, it has to come from the country itself. And then I think there are, of course, those instances where you say, okay, the government is never going to do this itself. It's not going to come about itself. And we really need, we need this to happen. Like Germany, Germany could have really used a truth commission. They really could have, that would have been mm -hmm. good. But I think we figured it out in a good way without, without them. Um, or maybe that's just because I'm German and I've been learning German history since I can read um, because that's part of our curriculum. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot that, that brings up a lot of contentious points. Um, but I do that's think, what we do here on Think Tech. We, as you know. <laughs> well, it's like anything. You think about anything in the international community and you're like, oh, okay, how are we going to do this? And then it doesn't work or it does work. It's a... You know, when, when, when is China, you know, going to uh, invite a truth commission into Xinjiang and the Uyghurs? I don't think anytime soon. I don't think when so is... either, exactly. And then it's uh, even if somebody says, we're going to set up a truth commission, China's going to say, no, you're not. You're not coming in here. And then that's we that. Need a, we need a better mechanism, I'll tell you. Okay, we're out, of, we're out of time, Cecilia. I really appreciate this discussion with you. It's really been uh, very refreshing and important. And I uh, hope we can talk again. In the meantime, I just want to say that uh, uh, it's, it's really nice to know a Canadian uh, living in Vancouver these days, because uh, especially a lawyer, because maybe um, depending on what happens in the presidential election in 2024, you can help me apply for Canadian citizenship. And, and then we can have these discussions in person. <laughs> Definitely. We will keep in touch. I hope that doesn't happen, um, that you have to run away. But for sure, thank you so much. I had a lovely time. The same. Cecilia uh, Pesterman, thank you so much for joining us today. Aloha. Thank you.